So this is the um, 150th Oral History Project, and this is Dr. Philip Clay. And um, I guess I'd like to start out, um, we're, we're interested in stories. So can you tell me a little bit about um, where you were born and what it was like growing up in Wilmington? Uh, I was born um, in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, and I was uh, born um, in the uh, late uh, mid-40s uh, and uh, grew up in the 50s and 60s. Growing up meaning I sort of had some idea of what was going on in the world. Um, so I remember uh, on my eighth birthday, uh, the uh, Supreme Court decision, uh, the Brown decision on uh, desegregation occurred. Um, I won't claim at eight years old to have understood the law, but I did understand uh, that there was a momentous change about which the predominant uh, feeling uh, among my family and people I know or knew uh, was both hope and fear. Hope that this would be a change and fear that the change might actually not be initially good and perhaps not apply to Wilmington. Um, the fact is that it did not apply to Wilmington, uh, so the entire educational experience I had in elementary and junior high and senior high school uh, was in a segregated school. Now the truth is that uh, for reasons I'm not quite clear, um, there was always a very strong educational tradition so that after Sputnik, uh, as occurred in many places in the U.S., there was a redoubled education to um, uh, accelerating educational preparation uh, and uh, tracking and the talented 10th and other dynamics were in place so that uh, I was among the, say, 30 or 40 kids in my county, uh, black kids in my county, who in the fifth grade uh, were plucked out and told, you, we're, you're going to skip the seventh grade. Uh, you're going to go to an accelerated sixth grade uh, because, you know, the nation, you know, we have these things that we have to do. And I remember quite explicitly uh, President Kennedy uh, challenging the nation uh, to the uh, uh, moon adventure. And I remember explicitly uh, a deep sense that uh, at least the talented 10th were destined to college. It wasn't a question about whether we would go. It wasn't a question about making the right choices in terms of the courses you would take. Uh, there was an expectation which was communicated uh, uh, to uh, my family um, who were very supportive. And um, lots of things were put in our uh, way uh, to make sure that we were prepared. And this ranged from the acceleration. We skipped things like North Carolina history. That was considered not terribly important for people who were headed to the moon. Um, and we went straight to um, uh, what would eventually be advanced uh, science courses and, and what we would now call AP courses. I don't think they were called AP in those days. Um, so I had a very good high school preparation. I had a very supportive family. Uh, and I recall uh, in the sixth grade uh, that uh, uh, the smartest, uh, uh, the brightest uh, bulb uh, was not me. I think I actually graduated um, eighth or ninth in my class. But the, clearly the smartest person in the class was uh, a young woman who was the oldest of 13 kids. Uh, and she came to school periodically. Whenever she came, she did a great job. But after a while, she disappeared. Now, it's possible she moved away, but my guess is that, you know, she was what we would now call a parentified child and essentially uh, had a stunted educational experience because of the demands of uh, uh, taking care of her younger siblings. And I understand that because, at least in my own family, my uncles were similarly pulled out in the Depression and told, you know, it's more important for you to work than go to school. Um, 
but uh, I never had any of that kind of pressure, even though I was the oldest of five boys. Uh, we were always uh, told, you know, your job is to go to school, and the only reason you can't go to school is that, you know, your body can't hold itself together. <laughs> so what, it, what was the um, environment at home? What, what, what did your parents do? Well, I was always encouraged. Uh, my parents, my mother graduated and father graduated from high school, but they did not have professional jobs. And most of my family uh, did not, most of their siblings um, uh, did not graduate from high school. And no one in my family prior to myself had graduated from college. How did your um, parents support the family? Uh, my father was a barber, and my mother worked at various jobs. And your siblings? Well, they were younger than me. Well, no, I mean, do they, <laughs> tell me just a little well, about I, them, how many? I, I, well, there were five, and they had various experiences. I think we were all very strongly encouraged uh, um, uh, to do high school. We all graduated uh, from high school. I was the first to go to college, and they had various experiences and have ended up in various jobs. Uh, my second oldest brother, you know, retired before I did, but, you know, that's okay. How did you um, wind up going to... I did. I haven't retired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you wind up going to UNC at Chapel Hill? Well, part of the um, push to college was, uh, you know, every um, prior class... Uh, where there were successful individuals in terms of going to college, uh, there was a great local profile to their success. So um, if you could imagine a graduation where the emphasis was not on how well the basketball team did or the football team, but how much scholarship money the senior class won. Uh, I, re I don't remember any of the numbers, but I remember the number being tallied. Um, so there were uh, uh, the older brothers of my classmates, and sisters too, of my classmates who went on to Ivy League schools and to other great institutions. And they would uh, come back to visit, you know, the Friday before Easter or the last day before the uh, Christmas vacation or at other times, and talk about their great experiences at Columbia or Penn or some other institution. Uh, and this was designed, I guess, to motivate the rest of us, you know, that there is a reward at the end of the tunnel and you too might win, you know, $50,000 in scholarships and that sort of thing. Uh, and that was very encouraging. So the older brother of one of my best friends uh, went to UNC. Um, and this was when going to UNC was a big deal and not because it was hard to get into, but because none of us had ever been invited to come. Um, so he, uh, uh, sometime during my uh, junior year, uh, took me back to campus uh, and look around. And uh, Chapel Hill is a very active place. Uh, and uh, I must say that the fact that uh, Jesse Helms thought that, you know, the whole place should be turned into a parking lot, you know, helped get my attention to it. Anything he was against, I was probably for it. Uh, so I went to the campus, I visited and liked it very much. My friend, the younger brother of this guy, went to Duke. How was it that you first got interested in urban studies? Well, being a child of that particular period of history, uh, I picked up on sort of what the great challenges were. And my first uh, and this was in high school, my first uh, ambition uh, was uh, to be a diplomat. I thought that the Peace Corps and world peace uh, were worthy goals. Uh, I managed to convince a, an English teacher once uh, that I shouldn't read. I don't remember what the novel was, but it was, in my view, a thoroughly boring novel, and I had no interest whatsoever in reading it. So I convinced her to allow me to read the autobiography of Ralph Bunch, who was a black uh, undersecretary of the UN, someone who had been um, uh, passed over to be uh, 
senior State Department official, uh, and who had a biography that wasn't terribly unlike my own life story. Uh, and, you know, sort of wandering through the library, I found it, and, you know, um, so that motivated me or uh, interest, made me become very interested in being a diplomat. Uh, and that lasted until maybe first or second year in college uh, when I uh, heard a joke from Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory is sort of a, uh, as a comedian of that period. Um, and his comment was that Americans are willing to go halfway around the world to tell somebody else how to live, but they won't go around the corner and they own it. And that sort of got me to thinking, well, maybe uh, the great challenges are in the U.S., and maybe I shouldn't be so interested in, you know, going halfway around the world to bring peace. Uh, so I think I drifted to a law school. And I remember at some point, probably as a sophomore or, or junior, going to the library to look at, well, what do, what do you study in law school? And needless to say, I discovered things like torts and civil procedure and criminal process and so forth, and that didn't look too interesting. And I then started talking to some of my professors about what are the public service professionals or professions that are new and bold and would sort of fit into the great questions that you know we were studying about because I was a sociology, urban studies major as an undergraduate. And that's when urban planning popped up. I, uh, they did not give, and still don't give, at UNC an undergraduate degree in planning, but they gave what they call a certificate, meaning you, it would be the equivalent at MIT of a minor. So I did, and you know, all, I was the only undergraduate in, in the classes I took. Um, and uh, when it became time to go to graduate school, that's where I was headed. So how did you wind up? What, what attracted you to MIT? Well, as many students do, they commit to go to graduate school and then they want to know where they should apply. So I went to faculty and said, where should I apply? And they gave me a list of five schools. Uh, MIT was at the top of the list along with Berkeley and Harvard. Um, I didn't want to go to the West Coast, so I came um, to Cambridge in uh, November 1967, uh, my senior year, uh, and I visited uh, Harvard in the morning and MIT in the afternoon. And at the end of the day, the choice for me was very clear. I was admitted to both and the rest is history. What was it that made MIT your first choice? Well, I think it's as simple as describing the two half days. Uh, the half day uh, at the other end of Massachusetts Avenue was um, uh, wandering around looking at the bulletin board. Uh, I did not have an appointment. Um, I didn't see too many people. Um, and sitting in classes, I didn't find it terribly interesting. Uh, I don't think anybody was unfriendly. They just weren't available. Uh, I came to MIT and I approached a couple of people. One of them would be uh, the professor who would become my advisor. Uh, and he gave me about an hour. Uh, all of the department's activities were concentrated in an area and, you know, it was open. I walked in and listened and looked around. Uh, people were happy to describe what it is they were doing and ask me what I was interested in. Um, I didn't see any other part of MIT unless, you know, it was just a matter of walking the hall. Um, and, um, you know, I had a sense that, you know, this is a place where I could be. So how, you, your graduate study, um, for, the, for the master's and the Ph.D., how many years were you a graduate student? Well, I was a graduate student uh, for one year as a master's student, and a good part of that year was spent in an unsuccessful effort uh, to avoid being drafted. So after uh, being away for two years, I came back in the Ph.D. program. I'd had some thinking over the time, lots of correspondence with friends and, and faculty. Um, and I came back as a Ph.D. student, so uh, I was a Ph.D. student from 1974, I mean 1971 to 1975. 
I graduated in February of 75, as I recall. And how would you describe those years as a graduate student? What's it like being a graduate student at MIT? Uh, it's probably um, not appropriate to describe it this way, that is the first, the years as a graduate student here, but I felt it was very much like going to work. Um, I, I got married uh, just before I came back. I married in June of 71 and I started graduate school again in, in September of 71. So I lived off campus and I had a life and I had friends who had nothing to do with MIT. Um, and I came and I went to class and I did my projects and I did internships. I would later do research uh, as a RA and then uh, as a fellow at the Joint Center in Harvard Square. And so it was a very focused, uh, I knew what I wanted. I had good advice, very good support. Uh, and in a field, I was in a field that was outward looking. I mean, when we did research, it meant going someplace. You didn't do it in Cambridge. In fact, I was quite explicit that I would not do it in Cambridge. There could have been opportunities, but Cambridge was a bit high maintenance. Uh, you have to spend a lot of time on stuff that wasn't quite critical, whereas I could go to Cleveland or, uh, you know, Prince George's County or New York and sort of focus on why I'm there and what I'm doing. You mentioned that there was a, um, the professor who gave you an hour and then became your advisor. Are, are there particular mentors that stand out from your graduate study years? That well, the person I'm referring to as, as the faculty member with whom I spent that first hour uh, was Professor Bernard Frieden. Um, and he did become my advisor. He uh, took several courses. In fact, every course he taught. Um, I was his RA. Um, and at the time, I was a fellow at the Joint Center for Urban Studies uh, between Harvard and MIT. He was the director. And when he stepped down as director, um, um, and I finished my degree and became a faculty member, and that was 1975, then I think by, I kept an association with the Joint Center, as he did. Um, and then in 1982, I became assistant director of the Joint Center. Uh, he was a wonderful man. Uh, he retired a number of years ago. He was wonderful because uh, he was quiet and patient, had a great sense of humor, uh, and was very generous with his students. Um, he was... Uh, uh, had very high standards and high expectations, but he was also the kind of advisor who would make things happen, uh, would say that you really ought to go to this meeting, and it would be a meeting about which you had no knowledge. Uh, and uh, he sometimes would tell you explicitly why you ought to go, and other times I think he probably said, this is a place you ought to be. Um, he and his wife Elaine um, had his uh, students over, um, you know, for events uh, he would host at his home. Um, and um, he was uh, generous with advice, uh, generous and, and gentle uh, with his advice. Sounds like he, he looked out for you. I think so. And, and he, he did. I think he saw it as part of his responsibility. I wasn't the only one. There were probably um, several of, of uh, our colleagues, uh, my peers, uh, who had a similar experience with him at a roughly the same time. Uh, many of us are still friends. Um, and um, he was a very effective person in the department. Uh, he was never department head. Uh, he was briefly associate dean. Um, but he was the kind of person who uh, uh, actually was able to have great influence by the questions he asked. Uh, I don't ever recall uh, in all of the years I attended faculty meetings with him, in all of the years I was his student, his ever making what we would call a sermon or a speech. But I do recall he would ask a question, and if people didn't get the message from the question, he'd ask it again, uh, and had a very quiet way of influencing processes. Have you adapted that yourself? Probably. I think there's a great power in universities in the questions you ask. Uh, I've always told students that 
Sometimes you'll make a bigger impression by the questions you ask than the answer you give, at least initially. Um, and um, I learned, you know, similarly useful lessons from my point of view from other colleagues. Um, I was a social scientist, and in social science, especially applied social science, we don't really do experiments. You really can't. But I had one uh, faculty uh, f member of our faculty from whom I took courses and with whom I was later a colleague, uh, who, uh, when things became complicated or difficult or divided, and he had a particular point of view that he was pushing, uh, he would sort of truncate the discussion by saying, well, let's do an experiment. Uh, let's do it this way, and then in a year or two, we'll come back and discuss how it went. Uh, and that was quite disarming in, in, in many cases. I wanted to ask a couple questions about your, your scholarship. Um, how, what led you to sort of become particularly interested in housing, housing policy? I don't ever remember a conversation with myself uh, in terms of which field I chose a conversation with myself that said I'm going to choose housing rather than transportation or health or some other policy issue. I think it was probably a consequence of the fact that housing is the most universal transition, uh, transaction in the way cities develop. Now it could have been jobs and economic development, but uh, the department really wasn't very strong in economic development at that time. We have since become much stronger in it. So I suspect the answer to you, the question of why housing, is simply that it was the basic transaction in community building. Okay. Everybody has to live somewhere. What are your thoughts about housing and housing policy in this country? Well, I've had the uh, opportunity uh, to be engaged in the evolution of housing policy over this uh, long period. Uh, in a variety of ways, um, teaching it, writing about it. Uh, s second, uh, I've had the opportunity for foundations and others to be an advisor on it. And I've been a member of a board um, since 1980, where we have in Boston and then in the last 15 years nationally used every opportunity to explore ways of building communities uh, that housing policy would allow. This is not only U.S. housing policy, but the housing initiatives that states and cities uh, came up with as well. So I've had the opportunity to be deeply involved uh, without having to leave the academy uh, and roll up my sleeves all day. I, only roll up my sleeves once a week or once a month or two days a quarter or some other way of engaging, but still having hopefully made a contribution to the organizations in which I was involved in how they would make use of resources to advance uh, shared views about how communities should develop. So what, how, has that, how have you seen the field change over the years? Over the years, the field has changed in a variety of ways, and um, it's been my um, pleasure to observe it both as a way of helping to prepare students, the practitioners who were, and scholars who would go out into that field, uh, and how we serve the sort of social goals we have for community development. Um, there's several things that I would describe as having emerged during this period because I think it's probably fair to say the field grew rather than there being discrete cycles. So I think we've gone, f we've gone from a point where building public housing would be a principal way of adding to supply to a set of policies aimed at facilitating the development. Um, so we provide tax credits to developers rather than actually the cash subsidy to build the housing. We also evolved to a point of trying to balance um, the development of housing with the provision of a cash assistance. Uh, because even though we 
had this evolution of support for housing development through tax credits and financing mechanisms, there was also the sense that we couldn't possibly build housing or subsidize housing for everybody who needed it. So we've developed a number of direct subsidy arrangements. We've also uh, revitalized uh, the notion of home ownership. Uh, home ownership was a big deal after World War II uh, through the 60s. And then it sort of fell out of favor. Uh, and I would say more recently, in the last 15 years, it has come back in favor. And we've gone through a period where we were trying to make housing uh, accessible to a broader range of people as housing affordability escalated as a problem. To give you an illustration, um, when I bought my first house, the rule was that you could not spend more than 28% of your gross income for housing, um, and you had to make a down payment of a specific amount, and that depended on what kind of loan you had. Uh, and you had to have um, uh, meet all of the underwriting criteria. So, for example, if, you have, if there was a 10% down payment requirement, you had to prove to a green eye shaded banker that you had that money for six months prior to the time you bought the home because they didn't want to risk that this was a secret loan that you were going to have to repay and that that would undermine your ability to afford the housing. And I remember also that they checked income. They not only wanted to see your pay stub, they wanted a letter from your employer saying that you were employed. And six weeks later when you closed on the house, they wanted a letter to make sure you were still employed or, or the last week's pay stub. Well, we obviously uh, had a situation where not very many poor people could pass through all of these filters. And so we created a variety of mechanisms that made the filters um, less of a barrier. Um, and the home ownership rate, you know, all of a sudden tacked up uh, somewhere after the mid-90s, especially after 2000. Um, so that was a trend, and of course we are reaping the benefits or, or the, the bitter fruits of that effort in the current uh, financial crisis. And, you know, I think part of it is that some people were squeezed into more housing than they can af could afford, but there was also the issue of fraud and poor underwriting, things that, you know, never would have passed, uh, even with relatively high-income people uh, a, a, a decade before. Another trend has been focused on community. Um, that is, you don't just build a house, but you strengthen a housing market, or you reverse decline in an area, or you do mixed income development, or you piggyback uh, economic development on housing development, or vice versa. So those have been some of the major trends. And each of these trends has uh, had a different life at different points over my career. Um, I remember a push for home ownership in 1968 as a big part of the Housing Act of, of, the, of the Great Society. Uh, and then it sort of fell out of favor to reemerge 25 years later. Almost the same rhetoric, many of the same provisions. I'm not even sure if, you know, is there an answer to this question, but is there a way to to sort of articulate or summarize what the major obstacles are to um, good housing policy? The obstacles to housing policy are several. Uh, the big one is affordability. <clears throat> housing prices and rents have gone up faster than incomes. In fact, if you were to isolate the middle class, however you define middle class really doesn't matter. <clears throat> but if you look at the incomes of the middle class, they've essentially been stagnant since the mid-1970s in real terms. Uh, housing prices have not been stagnant. So it's not surprising that individuals, families, um, have had to devote more than that old 28% 
of their income to housing. Uh, that wouldn't be so bad, uh, except other things have gone up. The cost of energy, uh, insurance, um, our habits. Um, I don't think anybody had latte or bottled water uh, in the 60s, and those things add up. Um, and um, uh, I think landlords on, on the rental side uh, have had a variety of motivations to raise rents or pressures to raise rents much faster than incomes. So affordability is the first obstacle. Second obstacle is that we've had uh, a struggle for turf in ways in the last generation that we did not have in previous generations. Uh, one of the first uh, studies I did uh, in uh, uh, after becoming a faculty member was to look at the gentrification process, the process of middle class reclaiming of urban neighborhoods. So that um, uh, cheap housing disappeared because in some locations that housing, irrespective of what condition it was in, uh, became an attractive location for a middle class that wanted to live in the city. If we look at some neighborhoods, the areas where the middle class reclaimed are the areas that had been the cheap housing uh, in the previous generation. Some of the explanation for homelessness can be explained by the fact that the areas that used to be the cheapest housing, rooming houses, um, just the bottom of the market was essentially pulled out in the late, mid, late 70s. And so by the early 1980s, we had homelessness. And the question was, where did these homeless people come from? Well, they came out of the areas that we had just reclaimed. Now, there are other explanations, too. Uh, uh, Deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill, for example, uh, recession that lasted very long, uh, almost indefinitely in some regions and in some parts of the of metropolitan areas. Uh, so that change uh, is part of the obstacle. Another obstacle um, was that housing became much more of a commodity. Now, while there have been efforts at sort of the development of nonprofit housing, and I've been associated with that in, in a number of different ways, uh, most other efforts were aimed at commodification. Uh, we couldn't build single-family houses fast enough, so we convinced Americans that, well, you can buy an apartment, and we can turn that apartment uh, down the street into your future home. Um, many people found that strange, but housing was in short supply and affordable, uh, not affordable at some distance, and so, you know, we went from you know, single-family houses versus rental apartments to this category called condos. Uh, <clears throat> another obstacle uh, were uh, location environmental issues. Uh, there are places that, you know, had we been able to build housing that might have moderated price increases, uh, but that housing, affordable housing, was not built. Uh, there are transportation issues, uh, you know, far away bad location, not in your jobs. Uh, and then um, uh, we sort of lost our will to have national housing policy to counteract these strategies uh, starting in the 1980s. Uh, I think the Reagan administration basically felt that housing was not something that the federal government ought to deal with. And so while in a different generation we might have addressed some of these problems quite dramatically, uh, for the 1980s through about 1992 uh, or three, we basically had no housing policy other than um, the effort on the part of cities and advocates and public policy people to preserve the, uh, the elements of, of housing policy that survived from the previous generation. Congress would routinely overrule uh, the Reagan administration's efforts at dismantling the system, uh, but they were always significantly short of successful. Uh, so over time, the pieces fell away. Is there, is there a particular contribution you feel you've been able to make in the field? 
I think other people have to answer the question of what my contributions have been, but where I've tried to contribute um, is in uh, bringing some knowledge and some um, clarity uh, to what was happening and to how practitioners, our own students, would uh, be effective in that environment. Um, I tried to uh, help people understand in the early 1990s uh, that we that that system we had built had pretty much eroded and that we were not only uh, seeing the evolution that led to housing but we were creating homelessness uh, and I've tried to uh, bring uh, some clarity to uh, racial discrimination and community building uh, and then in the organizations in which I participated, I hope I made some contribution. Is, is some of that contribution connected to this, the, you know, the, um, the National Commission policy recommendations that became part of that, the Housing Act of 1990? Yeah, I think the study I did uh, in 1987, that sort of percolated into the Housing Act, I believe, of 1990 or something like that, uh, where I think... Uh, Congress really did w try to reclaim some of the responsibility for what was happening with respect to housing policy. So it was a fortuitous uh, uh, coming together of a piece of work and uh, an opportunity to have some influence in the way legislation was written. Uh, so an organization emerged out of that. Um, we had nonprofits before, but we did not have nonprofits that moved uh, directly into the area of preservation of affordable housing. And I think that's one of the things that I'm pleased to have been a part of. In fact, uh, 19, I, I joined uh, the, the founding board, uh, um, I'm going to get the dates wrong, probably by 1994, and I've just gone emeritus. Congratulations. Um, is, for a minute, I wanted to ask about the books that you've written. What is it that you didn't, that you um, needed to say about urban studies or housing policy that prompted you to write these books? Um, well, the first book was the one that focused on neighborhood gentrification and incumbent upgrading. And I think I tried to make two big points there. One was uh, that what we had as a paradigm in the field that neighborhoods decline and, you know, proverbially just rot away or bulldoze, that that doesn't have to happen, that neighborhoods can be reborn. They can be reborn because their original architectural, social, class role is reclaimed, as occurred with uh, gentrification. Or it can be reborn because resources become available to working class families uh, to reclaim the neighborhood and rebuild it to uh, strengthen the market and to improve physical quality. And it was my goal in that book to make both of those points, to uh, make it clear that you don't need uh, uh, you know, heart surgeons with extra cash to come in and fix up an old house, that you can have the sons and daughters of long-term residents of the neighborhood come in. Uh, the latter group will need a bit more help than the surgeon with extra cash, but that can be done. Uh, other works uh, that I did uh, were aimed at uh, trying to point out that uh, a combination of those barriers that I mentioned earlier uh, related to affordability, changes in the financing environment and the regulatory environment were all combining uh, to contribute to the homeless problem. Homeless problem in the sense of the supply of affordable housing, low-cost housing, uh, was eroding. Uh, and that that's something that we needed to focus on rather than focus on the macro issues because uh, the Republican and the Reagan administration had abandoned housing policy in favor of macro strategies aimed at, you know, uh, uh, 
at monetary policy and fiscal policy, not housing policy or jobs policy or health policy or any of those other issues. Uh, and so that work was aimed at trying to uh, pull together the information to document that uh, what we had held dear, namely access, affordability, um, uh, uh, were at risk and seriously at risk. I learned one other thing, which is that it's best to write your own communications because uh, in that study, um, and I remember it distinctly, uh, it was about to uh, be uh, released uh, and someone sent me a, a draft a press release and there was one phrase in there that I overlooked uh, and uh, it represented a misrepresentation of what I said in the study. Not a serious misrepresentation, but a nuance. Um, and uh, I, I don't recall exactly what it was, but they essentially pulled a number, an irrelevant number, and placed it with my estimation that we were losing housing. So somehow I, they publicized that five million houses were being lost, and I never said that. I said we were losing the stock, but five million was never a number that was either correct or that I put in the study. So for a good third of the communications with the press, it was to straighten out that misperception. Valuable lesson. Yes, <laughs> yes. Let me refocus back to, to MIT, because I have a lot to ask you about that. Um, how about if we start with the School of Architecture and, and Planning? Um, is there, what role do you see this school having in the MIT campus at large? The role of the School of Architecture and Planning has evolved over the period when I was here. Uh, when I came as a student, uh, my world was the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Uh, and the Department of Political Science. The Department of Political Science at the time had a number of faculty members, Al and Al Shuler, the most prominent, uh, who were interested in urban politics and uh, international politics and collaborated with our faculty, cross-listed courses, uh, students moved back and forth in terms of participating in seminars and, 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 the, and the like. So my world uh, was Building 7 and Building E52. And I didn't much notice what went on in between. Um, that changed a little bit as the years evolved. Uh, there are a couple of faculty members in economics who had a similar uh, connection to the department. That would evolve uh, shortly after. Um, Students who were interested in transportation would soon develop a relationship with civil and environment, well, it was just called civil engineering at the time. Uh, as the uh, environmental issues emerged uh, in the late 70s, uh, uh, that expanded the network a little bit more. Um, and it wasn't until, I would say, about 1990 uh, and I remember this because we had a strategic plan in the department that I think was dated 1992, where there was the explicit question and the challenge from the provost, uh, how uh, the department uh, would uh, join forces, collaborate more broadly, uh, so that we would participate in the major issues that developed uh, at MIT in which the department had some interest. Environmental would be the easiest to illustrate in that regard because over the period uh, since the late 1970s, probably a dozen departments had a significant role in the environmental research and education at MIT. No school was not included in that. And uh, our school, you know, played a significant role. Um, the next challenge was to go beyond uh, teaching and sort of minimal research engagement to a much more substantial engagement. And I think that has been, uh, that has occurred uh, to a much more substantial degree in the last six or eight years. 
I think students have been ahead of the faculty on this. Um, students would go to classes and make connections uh, that we did not recognize uh, in the curriculum or in faculty efforts. Uh, for example, um, when I was a student, I didn't do it, but a number of my uh, peers uh, took courses at the Sloan School. Uh, they identified a number of faculty there who were interested in organizational behavior, for example. Uh, and we had a regular group of students who would go to Sloan for that purpose. Um, uh, and of course there were those who had a more quantitative background and who would go deeply into infrastructure and transportation courses in civil. I think there is much more a, of an institutional department faculty leadership in making these connections now than has ever existed in the past. So the the change has been to, to have a much more multidisciplinary approach to urban studies? Well, I think the, the basic shift has been to move into the way MIT operates generally, which is you define a problem, you sharpen the questions, and then you bring to bear all of the disciplines and departments and people who can make a contribution to that. Uh, again, environmental is the easiest to illustrate, but um, uh, if we get into areas of economic development, uh, then the obvious likely uh, people to collaborate on such projects would be urban studies, economics, and Sloan. Uh, there have always been small personal connections at that level, but to organize courses and other kinds of initiatives uh, is of more recent venue. Is there do you see that as a particular role that the school has, either nationally or internationally? I think the international, the, the role the school has perceived of itself has been developed largely um, independent of relation to other parts of MIT. So in the international area, for example, uh, the school, for as long as I can remember, is the leading program in international development. Um, so when it came to metropolitan planning, regional planning, um, our close peers were, you know, UCLA, Berkeley, at Cornell at one point. Uh, but, you know, we were the leaders. We had big projects in uh, several countries around the world, in South America and Africa and uh, the Middle East for many years. And we did that, uh, and, you know, there are stories of urban studies faculty sort of meeting, you know, civil engineering faculty in the airport in Cairo. Uh, they were there working on the same region, but on different projects. I think now they're more likely to be working on the same team. Can we talk a little about your, your sort of progression at MIT from, you know, professor, department head, associate provost, assistant director of the Joint Center of Urban Studies, can you just sort of tell me the story of that evolution? Uh, I'm probably not able to tell a story of the evolution, but let me just affirm that those were the, the steps I took. Uh, I think the basic explanation is that I probably have a, you know, a DNA element called service and saying yes. Uh, I tend to like in situations where I'm present to try to make a contribution. Um, and I think I do it in a way that I offer myself in a way that's uh, uh, appealing to some people. Um, and MIT has been a place, still is a place, that looks for leadership among, tends to look around the table for its next uh, academic uh, leaders in departments and schools and programs and so forth. So I guess I was, once I got around the table, then I would sort of be in line for the things that would occur. In my department, for example, um, in the 77 years of the department, uh, this last transition is the first time we've gone outside the department for a leader. Um, 
and that's not unlike many other departments at MIT. So it's not surprising that um, I would not sort of be in line for something. I think if I were to try to uh, describe the mentoring process, uh, it is that um, there are opportunities in the department, progressively more challenging opportunities or opportunities that had more responsibility. Uh, and that if you got on that path and you didn't screw up, you moved up. Well, you must have asked the right questions along the way. So I, I have this note here, the definition of a chancellor. And it's so broad. It says, the chancellor has oversight responsibility for graduate and undergraduate education at MIT, student life and student services, oversight of many of the institute's large-scale international partnerships and other initiatives. What do you really do? Well, the definition of the chancellor's role, um, I think it's fair to say it, fair to say that MIT has, uh, you know, two as opposed to just one senior academic officer. And the chancellor's role is uh, principally uh, activities that relate to education and students, and the deans and the units related to that report to the chancellor. So that's the simplest definition of the job that I have, that the job Larry Backow had before me, and that Paul Gray had before that. Um, all of those other things you mentioned turn out to be um, areas that uh, um, represented particular opportunities. Uh, I did have some responsibilities for international oversight when I was associate provost. So that responsibility sort of followed me around the corner. They've since been um, reassigned to uh, Phil Curry, who's the associate provost. Uh, but I still have my fingers in a few things, and it's sort of hard to disentangle uh, because many of these are relationships, not just jobs. And they take more time um, uh, depending on you know where they are and most of them are fairly mature, so they take a lot less time. Um, but I think the origin of the current definition of the role really goes back to 1998, when Chuck Fest um, received the report from the Task Force on Student Life and committed MIT to greatly changing the way student, the students experienced MIT. And there was a lot to be done, and he wanted to have someone uh, senior whose job it was to make those changes. At that time, we had a, a dean for undergraduate education and student life, um, and we decided, he decided, uh, that those positions ought to be split, that we should have a dean for undergraduate education and a dean for student life and that there was a very long agenda for each of them. And it's been my responsibility and Larry Backhouse before that uh, to work through that long agenda. So let's talk about what student life was like before that report came out that prompted the, the commitment to make a change. Mm -hmm. what, what was identified as needing to be improved? Um, the, the, the changes that uh, the task force uh, proposed, that the faculty adopted, and that Chuck wanted to implement, uh, was a very long list. And, and let me just illustrate it. I don't want to suggest that I'm giving you the whole list. They range from a resident system in which the, uh, in which the focus uh, was on minimal, uh, to put it simply, adult supervision. Uh, we had a system where uh, the dormitories were buildings that students lived. There were housemasters that gave a variety of oversight based on their disposition and the physical characteristics of the building and the historic culture of the building. 
uh, but you couldn't say that there was an approach to student life. We had fraternities that were um, very strong in the sense that uh, the best of them provided an invaluable environment to their students. In fact, I think it would be fair to say that the best description of the experience of being a student at MIT often is associated or was associated with being in um, some of the fraternities rather than living in the dorm, though there were exceptions there. Uh, we had um, a, a judgment, a conclusion about the pace and pressure, that MIT was a hard, rough, unfriendly place, uh, that students were on their own, that faculty didn't wander across Mass Avenue, that the western part of the campus was a refuge that students would go to at night uh, to get away from the Institute, which was on the other side of Massachusetts Avenue. Um, uh, we didn't have a lot of programs, but there were a lot of activities. So it was very easy to set up a, you know, a juggling club, but there wasn't a notion about well, where would they practice and how would they be a part of the National Juggling Association. We had athletics in which lots of students participated, uh, much higher than most institutions. Um, but we had very, very... Uh, um, marginal facilities. Um, we had some great coaches, but we had other uh, uh, sports that were under uh, uh, under invested in. Uh, and we had the perception that this was a rough place to survive. And while those the, the statistics did not support it, there was a sense that students were overstressed, and you know suicide rates were high, and nobody cared. So that was the scenario, that was the image that people had. Some of those things were very true and embarrassingly true. Some of them were just perceptions. Uh, faculty really did care about student life. And some dormitories had wonderful cultures that the, the alumni now uh, reflect on. Uh, but we weren't getting the message across. In some cases, we were underperforming. And in some places, uh, it was, uh, it was, there was a gem that wasn't polished or held up for its true value. And that's been the challenge to change all of those things in the last decade. So, and the last, and 1998 was 10 years ago. Tell me about the changes that have taken place. Well, I think while some fraternities uh, have not made it through this period, uh, I think the system is stronger now than it has been. I think we have invested a great deal in supporting the system uh, and supporting it through a transition that involved having freshmen live on campus as opposed to uh, the first week of a student's experience be carrying a suitcase around campus looking for a place to live. I think we've created, uh, with the strong support of alumni, a set of facilities that much more honor the interests that students have and the passions they bring to this campus about activities, uh, whether it's athletics or music. I think we have programs now that uh, uh, put resources uh, to support uh, what we think students ought to have as an experience, whether it's theater or um, or affinity groups. Uh, I think we have uh, uh, a great deal more invested in, in community health, uh, mental health. And I believe the uh, housing experience is more uniformly positive uh, than it was believed then. We have a house master system and GRT and residence life program staff who support student initiatives as well as uh, provide a framework, an infrastructure for student activities. I believe we have more support for student leadership development because the underlying point about all of these is that there's a great expectation that students would take responsibility for major elements of this community. Um, 
there are no faculty uh, supervisors in fraternity houses, for example. There are enterprises run by students. And so we've given a lot more attention to student leadership development. And this has been joined with a greater attention to more active learning on the academic side. And I believe lots more students uh, develop a voice and a sense about uh, their own responsibility for taking action. That is um, also a definition for entrepreneurship, which I think has also emerged powerfully in the same period. So in this, in this sort of journey from going to where the student life was, how it was evaluated in 10 years ago and where it is now, how, how far along is MIT in creating a more um, hospitable, seems too strong, but, but a, a, a more positive student life experience? I think the uh, efforts that we've taken over the last 10 years have been well received by students. Uh, we do surveys, um, and I'd say we've made great progress in every area. Probably the area where we've made the least progress is in dining. And I want to say a word about that because uh, as we built dormitories, uh, going back to before 1950, MIT was largely a commuter institution. Students, uh, if they're lucky, you know, lived in fraternities and had a great life. But otherwise, they were in rooming houses and scattered around the area. So as we built dorms, we had uh, two large cafeterias and um, students ate in those. And as we built more and more dorms, we became less systematic in how we addressed dining. So if you look at our facilities, we have some dormitories, the oldest ones have no dining facility, no kitchens. We have some later ones that have kitchens. We have some converted buildings that have apartment-like rooms, so there are kitchens, full kitchens. Then uh, in all of the dorms built since the late 70s, early 80s, we have a dining facility. So you have these three parts of the system. Uh, and we have, say, for undergraduates, 4,000 undergraduates. Uh, roughly 40% of them live in fraternities that have their own dining arrangement. So for roughly 2,000 students, we have this hodgepodge, and, um, and it's not a, uh, an environment where you could imagine where students would dine unless they happen to live in one of the few places, one of the three or four places, where there is a one meal a day uh, preferred dining plan. Uh, that's not where we ought to be. We are still working on that particular problem. Uh, and it's going to be challenging to solve because we built up an infrastructure around it that really uh, uh, has sort of grown up. So we were talking about sort of what might happen or what should happen over the next 25 years or some such period. Uh, I think we need to work with students on that, and I think we need to uh, uh, allow aspects of the MIT culture to be reinvented uh, to address this, and that I should not, having developed views at an earlier time, uh, impose those uh, on current and future students. Uh, but let me just describe some of the choices that I think are implicit in where we ought to go. Uh, if we were to take dining, which we were discussing a moment ago, uh, if I had to say what my preference would be, it is that, that dining, that is sitting down with um, someone else most of the time, to have your meals would be the preferred thing. This comes from my experience where, for example, I always ate three meals a day sitting down. Um, when I was a freshman, uh, it was with my roommate who was a junior, and I probably got the best orientation to college in going to breakfast with my roommate every morning. I don't think our students necessarily want to go to breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning, but maybe they could go to, they could have the same experience at lunch or dinner. 
I also had different circles of friends, and the way I routinely engaged circles of friends uh, were to have meals. Uh, you know, I ate the, the snack I had at 10 o'clock was with a different group of people than the dinner I had at 6 o'clock. And I think that from my point of view, dining is really a social occasion. Uh, you know, the food is one thing and, you know, you want to have good food. But really it is a social experience. It's an important experience and it will always be an important experience in a relationship, on a job, in building uh, connections with people. Uh, even at my advanced age, when I want to make some progress in that area, I generally think about having lunch or dinner or something. I don't think about standing on the hall munching. Uh, I don't think our students see it that way. That was not, that is not the world in which they have grown up. And so for me to impose that on them now seems to them strange and objectionable. But that's my view. I think we also have to uh, figure out how to deal with uh, uh, the diversity that's built into this community. I think universities have three opportunities to advance uh, students in this area. The first is in understanding the analytics of our diversity. Universities can do a very good job at that. Um, Second, uh, to have the university as an institution, a laboratory for understanding group, international, racial, cultural, gender dynamics, uh, and to practice that in the organizations and settings in which they are, including where they live. And then third, uh, the journey from 18 to 22 is really a long journey, and it's a very important journey. And part of it ought to be having students become comfortable in their skin. Um, so again, if I were to take my own bias, it would be that before you can become comfortable, you first have to be challenged or even made uncomfortable so that you can generate the questions and develop a point of view and develop relationships and practice those and then emerge with a voice and with some confidence that you can go out in the world and meet and live and work and deal with anybody. Uh, the students who graduate today will not necessarily be going back to Kansas. They may be going to Kuwait. Uh, they won't necessarily be going to Chicago. They could be going to China. And they should feel as comfortable in going to China from Kansas as uh, going to Chicago from Kansas. And I think universities have to deal with that. And the the best uh, indicator from my point of view uh, would be the students have some confidence that they can actually do that. And how do you do that? Well, I think we have to take them to China. I don't think there's any substitute for that. We currently um, have international opportunities for about a quarter of our students. I think we need to double that. I don't think we need it to go to 100%, but I think we need to get well above 25%. It, it is true that a lot of schools study abroad has become a much bigger element of the educational process yes. than certainly when you and I were in school, yes. where it was sort of a, it was an unusual thing. Yeah, my international experience was a weekend in Toronto in February. And for my it's son... It's truly international, but... At my son's school, 60% go abroad. Um, now, let me just say that I, I don't think our students will ever go abroad in the traditional way. That is, our students are not going to say, gee, I'm really interested in Italian sculpture, so I'm going to spend a year in Italy going around looking at sculpture. Um, there would be one or two students who do that, but I don't think we're ever going to get out of single digits. What our students are anxious to do and will take the slightest opportunity to do is uh, to pursue their passion, whatever it is, and it just happens to be that that will lead them to Italy or China or Brazil. Um, we have faculty, for example, who do research projects all over the world. So one easy way to advance student 
global experience is to create opportunities for those students to go to Brazil to work with the faculty just as they work with that same faculty member here on campus. Students are very interested in service opportunities. They're interested in doing things that will solve real problems. And there are real problems all over the world, and we should make it possible for them to go there. So they go to Ecuador. They have nothing in particular about Ecuador as a place of interest, but that's the opportunity to try out something new. And I think we should put as many of those opportunities in the way of students as we can. And I have no doubt that students will line up to take them. Are there any other big goals that you think or, or big changes that are planned or need to take place? Um, I think this journey, this transformation that students have to go through is, is probably the biggest one. I, I think um, we, we invest a lot in infrastructure and activities and programs. Uh, but nothing beats the human experience uh, and the opportunity to explore. Uh, and anything we can do there, uh, whether it's in music or the sciences or engineering or architecture or planning or development, uh, those become transformational experiences. I say this both as a faculty member and as a father. You send someone to a place that makes them slightly uncomfortable, that forces them to ask different questions, that forces them to listen to what they say and listen to what they hear. You force them to a, a encounter people who look at the same information and come to a different conclusion uh, and have some basis for why that conclusion is reasonable. Uh, if we can force our students into situations like that, whether they're there in uh, um, uh, China or New Orleans, uh, we, will, we will put them through the transformation that will make their educational experience more meaningful than an extra course or two. And you're embarking on the campaign for students? Yes. Is that, is that, why don't you describe what that is? Well, the campaign for students uh, is an effort uh, to raise uh, $500 million, two-thirds of which is for financial aid for undergraduate scholarships and graduate fellowships. The other third is to support student learning and student life initiatives. Um, the aim is basically to secure the access to MIT that is part of our tradition. We admit students without regard to their family resources, admit them basically on whether they fit MIT, uh, and then we meet the need that they bring with them uh, from their background. Uh, our alumni and friends have been very generous in the past, uh, and most of the commitment is, uh, is, is endowed, uh, but a good fraction of it is not. And the coming years will raise uh, the need even greater, uh, and the challenge to secure the future of this commitment is uh, even more uh, necessary than it has been in the past. And this is true for, and I want to emphasize this, this is true for both undergraduates and graduate students. So that's part one. The other part is when, as we've talked about uh, international experiences, as we talked about more active ways of learning, uh, new facilities to support uh, uh, different ways that faculty teach and different ways students learn, um, to upgrade some of our facilities and to strengthen and secure our programs. Those are the things that we have as goals for the campaign. Now we could go through some illustrations um, and I'll just offer one. Um, about 20 years ago we started the Public Service Center. It was started as a way to connect students to tutoring opportunities and other service opportunities that existed in the area and on campus. But what has emerged over the 20 years is that there are many faculty who want to tie into their teaching uh, opportunities to make the world around us, and sometimes that world really is halfway around the world, but to tie in real life problems and service opportunities with learning opportunities.
And we want to do that, and they want to do that in a way that makes for no barriers between a student's opportunity to participate in that educational opportunity uh, uh, and the student's own other needs. So, for example, if there's an opportunity in uh, another country to work during the summer, uh, there is the cost of having that student go to wherever it is to do the service. But for 70% of our students, the ones who have financial need, there's also the need to work during the summer. So to give the student the work, the educational opportunity, we have to meet not only the cost of that opportunity, but the cost of the summer missed earnings that won't occur. Now, what do we get out of that? One, we get passionate students having an outlet for passion, teaching faculty having places where they can teach a practice-oriented or an applied subject, a visibility for MIT in a world where talent really is uh, the coin of the realm, uh, and a refreshed education. The project in 08 won't be the same as the project in 09. And the opportunities for cross-learning between freshmen and sophomores and sophomores and juniors and the like uh, will be endless. I have some um, general questions about, you know, you're, you're sort of unique in that you've been at MIT for your entire career, nearly. There are a lot of people like that, actually. <laughs> um, is, how, how have you seen MIT change in the time that you've been here? Over the years I've been here, there have been a number of changes. I think we've become a most self-conscious institution. Uh, there was an MIT that was uh, unwilling to talk about its connection to the world, even though they were as active in addressing great problems in the world as much then as we are now, but they didn't talk about it then. I think now we think there is a great deal of value in talking about what we do in generating a greater sense of public understanding of science uh, and appreciation for the value of, of this information getting to the public, the general public, the policy public, the economic public. I think we've had a change in the physical expectations we have of the place. Um, we used to be quite accepting of a bit of grunginess and grayness and dullness and in, uh, in deference to sophisticated equipment and machinery and laboratories. Uh, and I think now we understand that people need a, an environment in which to work, uh, whether it's an office or a laboratory, uh, that really honors the fact that they are making a major commitment to this place and the place needs to support them in terms of light and air conditioning and room and um, fixtures uh, and services. It doesn't rule out tinkering, but a lot less tinkering now is necessary. Uh, and the tinkering that should occur should be about how you're building something to actually do a job rather than how you sort of protect your office from the afternoon sun so that you can work during July, which I, I remember when I was a graduate student. Mm -hmm. Got a great office, but it's sort of hard to be there after about 2 o'clock in the summer. And that makes a real impact on work. Yes, because we can now work all summer, all day. We don't have to let the staff go at 3 o'clock because it's unbearable, which is an interesting climatic impact because if you could identify one thing that allowed the South to rise again, I suspect it would be the invention of air conditioning. People can work inside on very sophisticated things all day. When I was growing up, you know, it just got hot and you didn't want to do a whole lot during the summer and some things just became very difficult to do uh, when uh, you couldn't attract people who wanted to suffer the heat. 
as you've um, as you've become part of the administration, what's been the attraction to sort of staying in that part of academia? Well, the willingness to go from one position to the next and to remain in administration is really refreshed by the changing opportunities and the changing challenges that are available. So the job in 2008 is nothing like the job was in 2002. Uh, and all of the things I've talked about give you some clue about how things have changed, but they are not boring and they don't become stale, they become more challenging or interesting or flexible or um, unique opportunities uh, pop up that you couldn't plan for or imagine sometimes. And it's clearly worth the um, less time for your own scholarly pursuits and less time in the classroom and... Uh, yeah, because the, the arena that you are in um, changes. Uh, I, this is only the third year that I didn't, have not taught. Uh, and that's because the work in the last three years has involved a great deal more travel over which I have less control. And I did not want to be one of those faculty members who needed a talk to, talking to from the department head or the dean about missing classes and moving things around to fit your travel schedule. So I've had to give that up, and I do miss it. But there's been an opportunity to engage a whole new set of people in our relationships outside of MIT that um, is interesting and challenging and exciting in its own way. Can you talk a little more about those external relationships, because that is part of your role as chancellor. Well, MIT has an opportunity to participate, initiate, support, uh, partner, collaborate in a variety of ways. Uh, and that it's been my opportunity from time to time to represent MIT as those activities are developed, sometimes to represent in celebratory ways, and sometimes to simply be a participant. Uh, and in that situation, I've had the opportunity to meet alumni and friends in places all around the world. Uh, just to give you an illustration, we uh, have a, a program in Portugal, uh, and this program was uh, developed by the Portuguese government in their attempt to move their investment in research and development, um, um, basically triple it over a decade. Uh, and they wanted to do this by engaging our faculty in a research collaboration with faculty in different institutions in Portugal. Uh, so those discussions happened over a period where uh, we tested whether the relationship could uh, be consummated on that basis, uh, who it is among our faculty who would be interested, who their colleagues would be on the Portuguese side, what kind of institutional arrangements are necessary, uh, and then we came to a view that this could work. Well, once that commitment was made, then this became a major initiative of the Portuguese government. Now, um, and you could imagine that this looks a lot bigger there uh, than it does here. We have, you know, thousands of universities, and, and universities aren't necessarily major partners in what our government considers to be major initiatives. So being a part of that from uh, the initial conversation, uh, you know, would you all sign this agreement day after tomorrow, uh, to um, going and working out the nitty-gritty problems of collaboration, long distance involving what now have been more than 40 faculty uh, and uh, several institutions in Portugal. That's, that's interesting uh, and challenging and exciting. And it provides our faculty with a set of research and collaborative opportunities which we could not have imagined a decade ago. Is your, is your background useful in those sorts of enterprises? Your urban studies background? The sp specifics of my background are not necessarily valuable. I don't think it really matters what your background is. Uh, I think what uh, is required uh, uh, is a clarity about 
our institutional interests, or at least some of what our institutional interests are, uh, a willingness uh, to listen um, and uh, to negotiate in the soft sense, um, because I think I don't want to say it was negotiation in the hard sense of where you, you know, going over minor words and IP policy and payment procedures and and tax issues and that sort of thing. Uh, others can do that far better than I ever could. But it is about creating an environment where our faculty and our staff can be productive, that they will feel comfortable, they will find the collaborative opportunities attractive, uh, that the brand of MIT is uh, protected, uh, and that uh, there are mechanisms uh, for uh, engaging uh, different kinds of faculty and to making sure that there is something there that we can be comfortable with over the life of the contract. Um, I think I have the patience uh, to work on answering all of those questions simultaneously. Do you think that your experience, since you've sort of grown up at MIT and experienced it as a graduate student and professor and administrator, is that an asset? Do you ever find it a liability? Um, I think it's an asset. Um, I don't find it a liability. Sometimes other people do. Um, they somehow think that if you are an administrator, you're some kind of weird character that's somewhat less pure than a faculty member who isn't troubled by uh, having to answer these questions. I don't feel that way. I think I have enough friends who don't feel that way, so I'm not troubled by that feeling, uh, except when it does get in the way and where I try to remind people that I am a faculty member and one day I will be a faculty member again, and that, you know, where I go uh, in those situations is to uh, what's the best thing for the institution. It's not how I feel or how you feel, it's what's the best thing for the institution. What do you think is MIT's role? Uh, does it have a, a world role? Well, I think we are uh, the leading science and technology focused institution in the world. Um, I don't say that in any bragging kind of way, but I think that is our uh, brand. Uh, and I think when you're the leader, then you do have some responsibilities. You have a responsibility to protect that reputation. You have a responsibility to uh, give back, that is to reach out to students who might not think they can come here and tell them that, yes, you can, if this is the right place in terms of your abilities and interests. We have an obligation to reach out for the talent that uh, would honor the contributions that those students bring. Uh, we have an, op an obligation to make sure we have an environment that supports the best people wanting to be here. Uh, and I think we have an opportunity to communicate to the public that has been so generous in our reaching this status and that we will count on to maintain the status. I think we have an obligation uh, to carry that leadership around the world uh, sometimes doing things which might not in the first instance appear to be uh, selfishly beneficial to us, but would be beneficial for the larger interests of science and technology and education. And how well do you think MIT is doing that responsibility and meeting those obligations? I think we've historically done a very good job at it. I think the, the way the challenge uh, is framed would be different in each generation. Uh, I think some of what I just described can be found in the words of MIT leaders going back generations, uh, but they probably weren't as focused on a global agenda as uh, the current uh, faculty and administration are. Um, I think their notion of outreach was for a much narrower framing of, of the MIT student than we have today. Uh, I think they probably were not as aggressive about diversity uh, as we are today. Um, and I think they probably uh, had a narrow vision of what it is you integrate than we have today. 
science and technology focus uh, did not always include outreach to architecture or planning or management or politics. I think there's a greater appreciation of that today. Have, you just mentioned the diversity. Have you seen the student body change substantially in the time you've been here? And I just don't mean its diversity. The, 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 the sort of personality of, of the student body, has that changed? In my view, it has, but I'm not going to try to characterize the personality of students. Uh, you get into great trouble with that because you're sort of loading on your own biases and images and experiences in ways that will sound to almost anybody who looks at this tape as sort of weird. And you know, where does okay. how, how is he talking about that? But but let me just share a couple of things. Um, um, in my own generation, I think we were probably, uh, and I'm speaking of my own experience, my, my own educational experience, uh, we had a far greater sense of, uh, of possibilities. Uh, I don't ever recall in college worrying about whether I would have a job. I don't think that ever crossed my mind. The issue was, which job did I want to have? That crossed my mind a lot, and I, I won't say I worried about it, but I certainly talked to people about it, and I tried different things, and I read about you know, different kinds of public-oriented careers, and I just figured that once I decide which one I wanted, it'd be there. And we had economic recessions. Uh, you know, There was a recession in my sophomore and junior year in college. I noticed it, but I figured that you know, when I'm ready for a job, there'll be one. I think our students now don't have the luxury of that kind of uh, carefree thinking about their own personal future. Uh, it's not their fault. I think they're in a world that seems has been much less, less hopeful in the way it has presented opportunity than I grew up with. I grew up believing that I would, of course, get a job and life for me would be better than my parents. And I don't think that had anything to do with where I lived or who I was. I think that was the way most parents and most students felt. I don't think we could say to a 17-year-old now that your life's going to be, in, in measurable economic terms, that your life is going to be better than your parents. That may or may not be true. There will be downward mobility. And students worry about that. And it's probably a, a useful worry. Yes, it's very and that, sad. And, then sad. That, and it is sad, and it works its way out into the way students view how they choose their major, how they spend their summer. Uh, parents are on them. Uh, you, know, you know, you must be an X and not a Y. Uh, my parents never cared what I majored in. They just wanted to, they just wanted to make sure I you know, had to get up and go to work. And I did, and they didn't worry. And some parents now worry, their students worry. And when they're not worrying on the same page, it's a source of stress for students. When you first came here, so did you first come here in the 60s? The late 68. 60s? 68. This institution must have been very male and very white. Has race played an interest? played some role in over the years? Has it been an issue for you at all? Uh, it has been an issue. It's always an issue. And I think if I were to say it's not an issue, my wife and daughter would probably exercise their health care proxy and haul me off someplace. At least I hope they would. I, the only thing I would like you to do is if you could mention race, because you, you, you started out by saying it's been. Oh, OK. I think race has always been an issue with me, and I expect it always will be. Uh, I joke with some of my friends that you know we'll probably be debating over how many slices of bacon we get at home uh, in, in future years. Um, and I, and I don't say that in a sad way. I think, I think notwithstanding this recent election, uh, uh, we, we do have race as an issue, and I don't expect it to go away. I'm very, very uh, delighted with the great progress that's been made, and I could go through all kinds of steps, uh, all, all kinds of 
uh, indications of, of upward progress that we've had in my time at MIT and in other places. I think what I have benefited from uh, was growing up in an area where, uh, in an era where uh, it was always important to us to be comfortable with who we are. Um, uh, and I see some evidence that young people today aren't as clear about that, uh, or as clear as I think I was at their age. Now, again, that could be my bias. Uh, but uh, I remember uh, from the earliest times uh, lessons about how to deal with race. Uh, uh, some of those lessons were lessons that I would sit, tell young people now and others uh, lessons that were wrong and I would not tell young people now. Um, but it was always something that was uh, the subject of sort of conscious thinking and planning. Um, uh, encouragement to move forward, to take risks, to step outside, uh, to get advice, to look for role models, to, to uh, filter advice through a number of screens, not just one. Uh, that is not just race, but other things, gender and where you come from and how you sound and you know the particular style of engagement with people, things like that. Uh, if there's anything which I do regret now with uh, young people is that there's probably a little, there's a lot less of a sense that that's necessary. Uh, adults, when I was growing up, found that was absolutely critical. Uh, and I can remember incidents where, you know, I would get a lecture from every aunt and every uncle about how I should interpret and behave on a particular matter that had come up in the news or in the neighborhood and so forth. And so I sort of entered adulthood figuring that this was something I had to deal with, uh, and I still do, and um, that's certainly what I communicate to young people that I have a chance to talk to. But I do know that many of these young people didn't grow up that way, uh, and the saddest situation is that when um, kids grow up being told that, you know, the world is open, everything is possible, racism is gone, and people look at you uh, as a person, uh, and they believe that, and then come up to a situation, inevitably, where that's not the case. Uh, those are the students I worry about, not the students who have um, the kinds of experiences we've all had, that I've had over my lifetime, and that you, you, you absorb and deal with and move on. Are there any examples you could give me of, you know, maybe how race might have been an issue in the earlier years that you were here compared to how it would be handled now? Um, I think there's now much more of a consciousness about mentoring. Fact, uh, this is on the matter of how we're dealing with race in the past at MIT versus now. Um, we now have mentoring, and I think, and this is not just for minority faculty, but for all faculty. And we have long, painful discussions about how to mentor, whether we should mentor, whether someone was not mentored properly, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't ever recall the word mentoring in the first X years of my life on the faculty. What I was talk, told was that you should seek advice. Uh, I was told that when I was in high school, that if you have a question about what something means, or about how you do something, or what something you saw means, or what a particular kind of behavior means, I was told that you should ask about it and that you should identify people who you, whom you trust and to whom you can go to and talk. Now, when I was in college, that those people were my peers. In fact, you know, one of my meals on any given day would be with other black students. And we basically, in at least half the conversation, were explain, it was sort of sharing our experiences that day 
and what they meant. And we all sort of jokingly, because uh, think about it, because at some point the, car, the question would start out, am I crazy or what? And then we would describe uh, an experience, and then our uh, peers, upper class peers, would you know, give their observation, and then we would sit and decide what it meant. Uh, and that's been my experience through life, and it's my experience today. And whether it's mentoring, you call it mentoring, or something else, I've always had a sense that I need advice, that I need to get as much advice as I can, and that I'm responsible for the decisions I make and the steps I take. Uh, if people get to uh, uh, college and don't have that perspective, I think they're missing something. Uh, and they're missing an opportunity for engaging with people that, you know, builds the kinds of relationships that I've enjoyed over my over my years. Ooh. And this is not just in, you know, sort of career development, but even in the kind of car I buy or, you know, how I advise, you know, kids on choosing college or, um, you know, whether to work in, you know, City Hall or, in the public sector or, you know, the difference between firm A and firm B. I think it's all the same. It's a matter of you don't know everything. How, what are the questions and who do you go to for advice so that you can make a good decision? What's interesting to me in what you just described is early on or the way that you grew up or, or the sort of responsibility was on you to seek out the advice. And now there seem to be discussions among faculty members that they have a responsibility to mentor. Mm -hmm. So more of the responsibility is on the faculty member. So that's... Well, this is... Uh, I'm glad you raised the point about where the responsibility lies, whether the young person, young faculty member should go out and, and, and seek advice or whether uh, their older peers uh, should have the obligation to give advice. I think both has have to be true. But part of my background says that I have to get advice because keep in mind that I grew up in the rural south in the 50s and, and nobody in my family had ever been to the university, much less MIT. And so for me, nearly every experience was a new experience. I had no prior knowledge, no handbook that I could read to figure out how I would act going to college. So in going to college, I had uh, the brother of a friend of mine who walked the path that I would walk. Of course I went to him and asked him every question, including a lot of dumb questions, and I think I learned a lot. I can't imagine going thinking that I knew what it meant to be a freshman in college. I had no idea. Right. No one in your family to ask. No one in my family to ask. But they were supportive of whatever I did, including things that I might do that would be counterproductive. Not stupid or criminal, anything like that. But if I thought I should do X, they said, well, that sounds like a good thing to do. They didn't have any way of knowing. Yeah. Um, in your years here, are there, are there any particular stories that stand out about MIT? Um, and in particular turning points or, or things that have happened to you that you think that's a real MIT story? There have always been people at MIT, especially um, uh, less true in recent, less obvious in recent years than in early years. There have always been people at MIT who would be champions. That is, people who had a sense that something should happen and that they would make it happen. And uh, I learned... Some examples of who, who stands out in your mind? Well, there was a time when I came where the number of, of uh, black students at MIT was very small. Uh, there were a group of faculty at the time. Some became administrators who wanted to change this and wanted to change it in a substantial way. Paul Gray was among those group of people. Uh, and they proceeded uh, to array their talents and passions in a way to make it happen. 
I don't ever remember a faculty vote on what it is they were doing. I don't remember any grand announcements about what they were doing. But I do remember daily hearing about things that were happening uh, that they were associated with that made a difference, sometimes in a major way. Uh, I had a department head when I joined the faculty who by our standards was not a very democratic person. Uh, I don't remember going to faculty meeting and ever seeing a vote. Uh, whenever an idea came up, he would allow discussion. He would just sit and sort of put his hand on his chin uh, and then say, I'm going to talk to a few key people and we'll see where we go from here. Now, I didn't have any idea as a junior faculty member what that meant. I would later understand what it meant, a particular way of leading, which is you don't want to leave anybody behind. You don't want to isolate or marginalize anyone. Uh, but you sometimes need to get a few people to adjust their attitude or position or opposition in order for the larger view, sometimes the majority view, sometimes it's not the majority view, but to go ahead. Whereas if he had voted, or if he'd put everything to a vote, some very good ideas would have been voted down. As it turned out, some very good ideas moved ahead, I'm sure, without explicit majority support. Now, I'm not sure whether when I do that, that comes off as anti-democratic or good leadership. But I think that as a practical matter in an institution when you're trying to make change, you have to be someone who uh, works quietly to create a path forward that may not be something that anybody would vote for. And sometimes it may even be something you would not want to put to a vote. Should offer that advice to uh, the president elect. <laughs> he knows it. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sure he knows it. Uh, he he exercised this kind of leadership when he was a Harvard Law student, was uh, president of the Law Review at a very contentious time at Harvard Law and among students. Sort of moving forward without giving too many people an opportunity to create a roadblock. Um, are there any other famous colleagues that you've worked with here? Well, I would rather talk about the infamous colleagues. Okay. Um, I've had a number of colleagues who I would never adopt their style. Their style is not my style. Uh, even if I thought what they were doing was effective, I would not be credible doing it. And so I wouldn't copy it. But I do understand that in an institution like a university, uh, you do have different ways of doing things, different styles. And if there's anything that I'm reasonably comfortable with is accepting that there are some styles that are effective that I don't particularly like. Uh, this is irrespective of whether I like the person, but some styles that I don't like, but I realize that they're effective and I could imagine myself supporting someone in a style that would not be my style. And, you know, many of these are very good people. Uh, sometimes it was hard to under for some of my friends to understand, how could you side with this guy? And I said, well, we, we're trying to do the same thing. I don't like his style, but I like what he's trying to do. John Silber's a good case in point <laughs> from BU. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you use the case of John Silver. I, I wasn't at BU, so I didn't have no. to experience his style. But, but that's an illustration. I could never do some of the things that are alleged of him. Um, but uh, in 1971, BU was a pretty pathetic place. Uh, and he did build it into a great university. And I'm sure there are people who appreciate the things, some of the things he did to make it a great university, but deplore the way he did it. And I understand that, and uh, I've had some infamous friends. The issue is my daughter, who is a class of uh, 2007 in, in city planning in the master's program. Uh, one of the deals I made with my daughter, especially 
significant in the digital world is that I don't talk about her because um, it would ruin her life. And I promised when she was age 11, I wouldn't ruin her life. Uh, but I will say that um, uh, she um, has many of the sort of uh, passions for service that I had and I had to overcome the fact that I was here. Uh, and I have lots of friends whose children have had to deal with that. And I was happy to walk in the basement for the first six weeks so I wouldn't bump into her. Do you have a perspective, you know, not of, of being a parent? You know, how you see the MIT experience as a parent? Well, I don't talk about parenting because there is a chance I might be quoted and I would ruin my daughter's life. Okay. But I do take a couple of points about it. Uh, I made a point earlier about transformation. Um, I think that if I were to think about students I've known, uh, young people I've known from, say, over a long period, say from when they were small to as they go through college, uh, what I take from watching them, including my own daughter, is the significance of the transformational experience. Many of these young people I know, uh, I could not have predicted when they were age 8 or 10 or 12 what they would choose and the style that they would adopt by the time they become 20 or 25. How they made those choices who influenced them in making those choices, what the various experiences they've had, uh, they had meant to them, I don't fully understand. So what I bring to my stewardship at MIT is the view that we should put in front of our young people as many transformational opportunities as possible, uh, give them advice about uh, how they should uh, uh, about the questions they should answer or uh, ask, uh, and then let them come to the answer. And I don't think when that has happened, uh, too many students make bad decisions. They don't make permanent decisions as often as they used to, and that's a good thing. Well, it's not really the, the climate that they'll be working in anymore, where you can choose something and then stick with it for 40 years. Well, Katrina was uh, a tragic situation, a, and in some degrees it could have been avoided, or some, some degree of the severity could have been avoided. Uh, that said, it was also an opportunity for us at MIT to do service and to provide an object lesson in a variety of areas, including planning and ecology and political science and a host of other, and history and a course of, uh, uh, of other subjects. Um, uh, we had uh, a number of generous alums who made resources available to support faculty and students in a number of projects that meant that probably for a three-year period after Katrina, there was always an MIT team uh, either in New Orleans working on a project or here working on something that they would take to New Orleans in the coming IEP or the coming uh, summer break. Um, I'd like to think that that experience will make all of those students, whether they were freshmen or graduate students, uh, leave MIT with a great sense of clarity about the urgency of, of uh, doing good work. I started out this comment by talking about avoidability. The situation in New Orleans was presaged several times prior to 2005. It was presaged uh, in uh, the way things were handled in the flood of 1927, which was not a hurricane, but a, a perfect storm of very heavy snow, very early spring, and an extended rain that created a disaster in New Orleans in, in June of uh, 27. Um, a lot of the lessons uh, that were available to be learned about water systems, about um, levee development and so forth were not learned. And some of the responses were in fact 
bad decisions that made Katrina possible. There was a second storm in 1965. Uh, again, major da damage, uh, clear object lessons, uh, but a quick return to, well, that's a 100-year storm. We, don't, we can move on. We don't have to deal with it. And another set of decisions that were made that made Katrina worse than it had to be. People sometimes don't learn. <laughs> yes. Um, there's a, a, something else I remember I wanted to ask you about is um, the story of MIT on September 11th because that was, you were the one who was coordinating that response, were you not? Well, I was the only guy in town after September 11th, so there was uh, the need to um, address a, a couple of questions at MIT, and I was happy that um, we were able to work on that. One was um, a sense of shock and tragedy, and in uh, in such situations, it is necessary to create some kind of event that would allow those expressions to be expressed in a community sort of way. So on the afternoon of September 11th, we had a Kresge Oval uh, event, and then the next day a more formal uh, community conversation uh, on Killian Court. The second thing we had to do was, uh, it became clear by early in the afternoon of September 11th uh, that the uh, attack on the towers would be associated with uh, Muslim terrorists, whoever they were. And they were beginning to be a sort of a sense of fear and anger directed in that direction, uh, in the direction of, of Muslims around the country. So. Part of the effort was to remind the community that we were a, an intentional community that had chosen each other and that the relationships that existed so well on September 10th uh, needed to be preserved. And it was very important on the afternoon of the 11th uh, to reach out to Muslim students quite directly and quite substantially uh, for them to participate in the community activity and that when we put together the panel of clergy, that we include uh, a Muslim uh, 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 clergy as well. Uh, and I think we, uh, unlike some other pl parts of the country, were able to make it through that uh, very difficult period with our sense of community intact, if, and perhaps even reinforced. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about? Thoughts you have about MIT? in any of the roles that you've been in? Um, thoughts about its future or its past or observations that you can share? I probably didn't realize at the time. Um, uh, when I came to visit in 1967, what it is that I found attractive. Uh, certainly were no glossy brochures. There was no recruiter. Uh, there was no one dangling a fellowship in my face. None of those things were true. But what was true was a sense of uh, uh, simplicity in relationships. Uh, people worked together because they shared a passion. Uh, the department was self-conscious about how it prepared its students and was willing and able to, t to articulate that. Uh, it made sense to me. Uh, uh, people were inviting others, uh, inviting uh, in the sense of wanting students to be a part of the activities. Uh, there was a sense that we were to make a difference in the world uh, and that we should prepare students professionally and in uh, academic terms uh, to take leadership roles. This was all done without pretension, without a sense that we are entitled to this leadership role, but that we earn it and that in uh, the phrase of an old ad, we have to earn it every day. Uh, it wasn't about who you are, but what you're doing, what you're working on, what you're trying to achieve, what question you're trying to answer. Those are the things that attracted me to MIT in 1967, and they remain true today.